Okay. okay. So we are absolutely delighted to have Dr. Diana Hernandez with us. Welcome. Let's give her a hand. Hi. Uh, hello. Buenas tardes. Um, Diana Hernandez. I'm uh, an assistant professor in sociomedical sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health here at Columbia. Thank you. Um, and today I am going to be presenting on energy insecurity. And for many of you, this term uh, may very well be unfamiliar, but the concept uh, and the experience and the phenomenon itself, um, I believe uh, will resonate. So this is kind of an environmentally uh, oriented talk. And so given that um, in the field of kind of environmental studies and, and environmental action and justice, uh, there's the whole mantra of uh, thinking global and acting local. I'd like to just start with two um, New York Times articles. And these are experiences that are not too, um, too distant. So the first headline is, a fatal Bronx blaze was caused by candles. And the first line uh, of the story is, a fire that killed three children in an apartment Friday was caused by candles that were apparently being used after power was cut off over delinquent payments, the authorities said. And then another one, uh, so this one was just before uh, the kind of cold winter that we've had uh, this year, uh, set in October. Uh, and then more recently, uh, in January, there was uh, another story in the New York Times uh, with the headline, for some tenants, only thing heating up is a temper. Thousands of New Yorkers complained of a lack of sufficient heat in their apartments, uh, a, uh, often a long time condition. According to the World Health Organization, energy is essential to meet our basic needs in terms of cooking, boiling water, lighting, and heating. It's also a prerequisite for good health. And the thing that I'd like to note here is that they also say this is a reality that has been largely ignored by the world community. And that leads us to some questions, including what do we call a phenomenon like this where someone's utilities are cut off and then uh, a family, in this case actually, two of, uh, I believe there were uh, five children in the family uh, who were killed um, in this particular uh, fire. And that particular household, along with um, along with the uh, with the other people in the building, uh, were displaced for a period of time uh, as a result of this fire. And what are the health and social consequences of this phenomenon? So that leads us to this uh, notion and this concept of energy insecurity. Mm. And the only other person that has written about this was Frank Cook and uh, colleagues that describe energy security as a cons uh, consistent access to enough of the kinds of energy needed for a healthy and safe life in the geographic area where a household is located. Um, also, the ability to obtain uh, the energy needed to heat or cool a home and operate lighting, refrigeration, and appliances while maintaining expenditures for other necessities, including rent, food, clothing, transportation, childcare, and medical care. Um, they actually conducted a study that was an emergency room-based um, study uh, in Boston, uh, and they defined moderate um, energy insecurity as a utility shutoff um, that was threatened in the past year, and severe energy insecurity as being uh, heating uh, the home uh, with a cooking stove, uh, a utility shutoff, or one day or more without heating or cooling in the past year. And what they found is that moderately and severely energy insecure homes were more prone to food insecurity, hospitalizations, and poorer health ratings. And for the severe energy insecurity group, uh, they found that there were developmental concerns uh, among the parents. And yet we still don't really know enough about this uh, situation. People throw in um, David Williams, I, I love his work, and he mentioned um, the Medical Legal Partnership for Children uh, and the kind of uh, checklist of social needs and heating was there, and yet we still don't really know enough about this particular concern. And so my offer to the scholarly uh, community is a definition of energy insecurity and a conceptualization of it. 
Um, and so energy insecurity refers to an inability to adequately meet basic household energy needs. It's a multidimensional construct that really describes the interplay between structural conditions of housing, the cost of household energy, and the coping strategies that households improvise with when heating, cooling, and other basic energy uh, uses are insufficient. Energy insecurity is a neglected phenomenon that burdens an estimated 16 million households in the US. And uh, I'll walk you through um, this particular um, set of images. So on the top left-hand corner, I don't know if this is working, uh, you'll see the condensation that's formed uh, in an icy window um, where there are clearly drafts and um, I imagine uh, this is not providing uh, sufficient um, a barrier uh, from the cold elements in this particular home. Uh, on the bottom uh, left-hand corner, uh, there's a, a man who's looking at his temperature at his thermostat and uh, really hyper vigilant about um, setting it at a temperature and wearing uh, wearing a coat, likely because he's responsible for the for the payments. Um, and then there's a woman who's just sitting in her home looking uh, a, a bit um, frustrated, potentially. Um, and, and as you'll see later on, uh, stress is one of the bigger health uh, consequences of this phenomenon. Um, and then, of course, the utility payments uh, and a bill that's um, on the bottom uh, right-hand corner. Um, in an uh, editorial commentary that I published in the American Journal of Public Health, I described a trifecta of insecurity, which is uh, about the, we often think about food insecurity and isolation from other forms of hardship, including housing insecurity and energy insecurity, but in fact, they're very much interrelated. But of all of these hardships, energy um, is often neglected in this kind of broader scheme of insecurities. Um, but we do know uh, in the literature that people are making uh, trade-offs um, and these kind of competing expenses lead to risk and disadvantage in health and economic well-being. One thing to consider is that energy costs tend to be comparatively higher for lower income groups, uh, thus reducing their ability to purchase other basic needs such as food uh, as they face the heat or a dilemma. Uh, speaking of, and uh, this conference in particular has had a significant focus on, uh, on food and obesity, um, there, was a, there were a set of studies that have uh, demonstrated that um, low-income households are more likely to uh, reduce caloric intake um, as, uh, as energy uh, costs and expenditures increase. Um, likewise, the receipt of um, kind of the energy equivalent of SNAP, uh, which is LIHEAP, Low Income Home uh, Energy Assistance Program benefits, protects against food insecurity and lower, lowers the odds of hospitalization in young children among low income renters. Uh, and SNAP has actually been found to cushion uh, the shock of skyrocket, uh, skyrocketing heating bills. Uh, and for example, very locally, um, just this past winter, people experienced a tw at, at the very least a 22% increase in their um, household utilities given how cold it's been. Uh, and so this winter um, in particular kind of uh, brings to light uh, just how important this, uh, this issue really is. And um, as you'll see in the next set of slides and when I describe uh, the data and methods, this uh, study is really uh, demonstrating the voice uh, and providing an opportunity for people to um, have expressed this based on qualitative data. And so uh, Miss Mary is a market rate payer um, in the Boston area. She's also a grandmother, custodial grandmother of two. And she explained, she said, if I had to choose between paying my rent paying my utilities, and feeding my grandchildren, I'd feed my children, and I'd worry about that later. My rent's always paid. If I can't pay my lights and my gas, and uh, those are in the winter months and stuff, I need to feed my grandchildren. I'm sorry, but my grandchildren are going to eat. So this study was based on my dissertation research. It was conducted in Dorchester, Massachusetts. Um, and it was a two-year study um, based on a qualitative uh, methods, in-depth interviews, and ethnographic observations of low-income households in the Dorchester area. It was actually linked up with the Medical Legal Partnership program that Dr. Williams uh, described um, yesterday. 
Uh, and basically, we were really interested in understanding what is the impact of legal services uh, on um, mitigating the relationship between poor housing and poor health. Uh, and one of the emergent um, kind of themes that came up uh, is that of all of the various housing problems that we were expecting to see, uh, energy insecurity emerges uh, a significant issue that had otherwise not uh, been addressed. And so, um, Con the conceptualization of this problem. Uh, energy insecurity is premised on hardship. Uh, and Carol, a Section 8 mobile voucher recipient and single mother of two said, well, I try to make sure my bills are paid, but that's a difficult job because everything's so expensive. When you're on a fixed income, what are you gonna do? There's really not much you can do. You can only do your best. And Helen uh, is a low-income homeowner and married mother of four, and she said, we're definitely not making ends meet between the price of food, the gas is killing us, just the normal day expenses. It's nerve-wracking. So energy insecurity, I argue, is a hidden dimension of disease and disadvantage and is characterized by three uh, kind of distinct elements. The first is the physical uh, element of energy insecurity defined by deficient and inefficient housing structures. There's the economic uh, component, which is about the disproportionate share of household income allocated to utility expenses, and the coping um, energy insecurity, which is about the, the coping strategies that are utilized. Um, so I'll first, um, I'll, I'm actually going to detail each of those components. Uh, I'll start with the physical energy insecurity. So according to, to HUD, uh, and the American Housing Survey, uh, lower income uh, households are more likely than their kind of more uh, privileged counterparts to live in housing with heating and electrical problems, have experienced multiple heating equipment breakdowns, an interruption in utility service, inadequate insulation and insufficient heating capacity, and also to report being uncomfortably cold from um, 24 hours or more in winter. Um, and Dianetta, one of my um, uh, study participants, said, yeah, this house, uh, there's no insulation in the house. That's why it's cold, and the heating's always gone, so the electrical is outdated, as is the plumbing. And Sarah, a Section 8 recipient, says, my bill is $4,500-something. My heat just keeps escaping. There's no heat. He says this is a four-bedroom apartment. Uh, there's no heat in this bedroom here. If I open this door, you feel like you're standing outside. There's no heat in here, and there's no heat in the kitchen. It's a big, huge, empty house. Sharon, um, who uh, is a Section 8 recipient um, and single mother of three, um, had her home audited by the local utility company. Uh, and the auditor um, you know, said to her, um, or, or basically she wanted them to, to come over, and she says, I want Boston um, Gas to come out here um, with some of their people so they can look at the boiler for themselves. Because the first man, when I got uh, my energy report, he told me it looked like I was heating the whole of Boston. This is Merle, uh, and Merle is also uh, a mobile housing uh, voucher recipient. And I'll get uh, a little bit later on uh, into why mobile um, housing vouchers um, are a bit problematic, uh, but even though that's uh, the, the way in which housing policy is uh, currently being directed. Um, but Merle says, my apartment was huge, but it was awful too because of the heating system. There was gas bills started, um, that's where my, my gas bills started to become so high. The heat would always go out. The furnace or whatever it took to control the heat would fail. The heat would be on and it would shut off and it would be on again. It was never constant, consistent heat. It was cold in our kitchen and a lot of our bedrooms were cold. So that basically was the start of my high gas bill because I had to keep running that senseless heat. And she went on to critique um, the structure of Section 8 uh, and the landlord's investment, uh, or lack thereof, um, in, the, in the housing unit. She said, the disadvantage of having a Section 8 voucher is that these landlords tend to take advantage. In a lot of Section 8 apartments, they only provide heat and hot water. It's always no utilities. It's not the best apartments. I'm quite sure it's not the best heating systems, because like I said, I've lived there. I'm a prime example. So we, we see basically that the kind of structural deficiencies, this kind of structural energy insecurity is actually leading to high gas bills as already demonstrated by Merle and others. 
Um, and uh, colleagues of mine at the National Center for Children in Poverty, uh, we recently uh, released a policy brief um, that was based on uh, data from the American Community Survey in 2011. And we demonstrated that um, basically among the very poor, so those that are kind of below 50% of the federal poverty line and just um, as reference, the federal poverty line in 2011 dollars was $22,350 um, for a family of four. Um, and the way that we're defining energy insecurity, economic energy insecurity at least, um, is that it exceeds 10% uh, of the household income. Uh, and this is what the Department of Energy uses as their threshold. Um, so 82% of the extremely poor experience energy, economic energy insecurity. 60% of those at 50 to 99% of uh, the federal poverty line experienced it. And 30% of those um, at 100 to 150 uh, percent of the federal poverty line experience energy insecurity. So we see that it's very prevalent among the poor. Um, but in looking at the connections between poverty and race ethnicity, we find that African Americans, so the green bar um, are African Americans, across the economic spectrum are more likely to experience energy insecurity, which we imagine uh, is a reflection of um, the housing stock available to African Americans uh, that may um, be kind of more structurally inefficient um, in terms of uh, energy. Uh, one of the other things that we found to be very interesting is the, uh, an immigrant paradox. So that native-born um, uh, people uh, were more likely to experience um, energy insecurity, um, but Latino and, uh, and Asian immigrants were the least likely. So we're actually, we've gotten a paper accepted to the American um, Sociological Association Conference uh, in August that basically is starting to grapple with this um, yet you know, another paradox, immigrant paradox. Um, what we also found, um, which was very interesting, is that in the South, um, so we looked at this by kind of national region, uh, and in the South they're disproportionately more likely to experience um, energy, economic energy insecurity, um, and that renters are also more, more likely to experience this phenomenon. Um, Roxanne um, is a mother and grandmother. She actually houses um, five of, of her uh, family members in her home, so it's a very intergenerational home. Um, and when I went to interview them, um, she had passed me uh, an NSTAR, which is their uh, local equivalent, their, their utility company, um, bill of uh, $1,971.52. Uh, and this was just for the electricity. And so she says, yeah, I pay them every month. I give them like 50, 60, 80 something, whatever I can give them. So clearly this is not getting to the, um, the full cost of the energy um, expenditures, which means that they have a mounting debt. Um, and that debt trap is something that we don't necessarily know too much about. Um, but, you know, there's always the, the issue when it comes to poverty that people should just work more. But we know that and the more people work, the more they're um, <clears throat> disenfranchised when it comes to um, access to, um, to certain benefits. So uh, Elaine is a low-income homeowner and a mother married uh, mother um, of four. Uh, she's married, and she says, we're still struggling. I'm not going to lie. We're behind on the bills and stuff uh, like that and trying to catch up now, but that's why I went back to work. But she says... It's either we're under or we're over. We're over or we're under. It doesn't make any difference. If he doesn't work overtime, we don't make the rent. If he does work the overtime, then we get um, stuck because he's making too much money, so it doesn't really help. So what do people do uh, to cope with the structural um, energy insecurity issues as well as the economic energy insecurity issues. Sometimes they're huddled in front of space heaters like this, um, but other times they're really um, investing in energy conservation. Um, and uh, Carmencita, who's a low-income homeowner and mother of two, says, our gas bill, thank God, has gone down because I don't use heat all that much. I mean, our heater goes down to 60, 61, 62 tops all year round, and my gas is budgeted. My electric bill, my electric bill has gone out of, the, out of whack. I mean, we have a $700 electric bill. 
um, other people leverage their medical vulnerabilities. So, uh, in every um, state, the utilities have different um, regulations around and policies around um, shutoff protections. Um, but many have um, either uh, provisions for uh, those who are medically vulnerable or um, who are very um, who are economically vulnerable. Um, in this case, Nancy and many other people describe this as a very common strategy. Uh, she's a Section A recipient and mother of three, and she said, the light bill was like 2,000 something dollars and I needed to get a letter stating that I had a child who was under a year old and that had a little mild asthma or whatever, because that way they can't shut your lights off for no reason at all. Um, people also use stoves, base heaters um, as um, as cool as heating alternatives. They self insulated uh, and and uh, put up their own kind of weatherization uh, techniques. Um, oftentimes um, assisted by local community based organizations uh, that were providing those kinds of services. Um, they moved more frequently. People moved from one home to another because they were trying to escape uh, the, the um, utilities uh, issue. Um, and then they were also factoring utilities into in, in their decisions to move. So that means that people were um, often uh, living in kind of poorer quality housing. Um, but if the utilities were incorporated, at least it was something that uh, they, they wouldn't have to be burdened by. Um, this was also true for people that lived in public housing and making decisions about whether or not to leave public housing, because um, in most public housing structures, uh, they uh, provide uh, the utilities. Um, and they also put um, put the bills in, in people in other people's names, uh, which is a problem that I won't even get into. But um, it provides these kind of involuntary debt traps for children often. Um, but what are you going to do? Um, so what are the health and social consequences? I'll just go over um, go over a few. But stress was the most obvious one. Um, uh, Mariah, market rate payer, says the only thing I worry about is just the bills. Um, that's it. I get stressed out with the bills a lot. It's like, um, got to take everything uh, kind of a day at a time. Um, and Deidre says, I, I asked her, like, you know, how does it make you feel that you're dealing with uh, all of these utilities issues? And she says, stress. It adds stress. It's silly sometimes, but I think, like, geez, my lights are going to shut off, even though I know they won't. Um, but even if I'm behind a few days a week, I worry. Uh, and then in terms of the kind of social consequences of this, one of the things that I thought was uh, particularly interesting is the question of family disruption, so the disruption of kind of normal family life as a result of utilities. Um, and Sylvia uh, says, um, that things kind of started to spiral downward for her when she was um, when she was depressed, uh, and she says, you know, things got messed up, and she says, then my bills just started raising up and raising up, and like I said, I went to the doctors because they turned it off. Matter of fact, they had turned off my light, no, my gas. So I sent my kids to their aunt's house because I didn't want them. You know, you can't cook or give them a bath or nothing. I didn't want them here. Um, and Tanika, a public housing resident, says, one day I didn't have no money to pay my bill, and they were going to turn off my lights. When you turn off your lights, people look at that, and then one thing leads to another when it comes to that. And I don't want nobody coming in here. Take my children from me because I don't, uh, because I don't have my lights on. My kids ain't used to living with nobody. So um, as a result of this um, kind of... Uh, research that I did um, before, I've now um, gone on to do a few um, research projects that are inspired by the energy and security framework that's uh, been developed. Uh, the first um, is to study the impact of energy efficiency interventions on uh, low-income households uh, that have benefited from the weatherization assistance program. Um, and uh, this particular project was uh, funded by the provost, uh, provost grant here at Columbia University. Um, it's a pilot study that I intend to scale up um, into an R01. Um, but basically, this is assessing the impact of energy efficiency upgrades, such as changing light bulbs, changing heating systems systems, um, changing windows, um, 
and uh, it involves in-depth interviews with uh, 20 households um, and surveys with renters uh, and homeowners. It also has a landlord component in which I've uh, incorporated in-depth interviews uh, with, uh, with landlords to better understand the process of going through the financing uh, and also the kind of uh, renovations to their, um, to their properties. And my community partner on this is the Association for Energy Affordability in the Bronx. Um, and then I've also um, engaged in uh, clean uh, in the assessment and evaluation of clean heat policies. So New York City is a really progressive set of laws uh, around um, uh, reducing um, uh, the emissions caused by residual oil, um, number six fuel in particular. So they're phasing out um, the number six fuel. Uh, and this has provided kind of a really opportune time to look at heat issues um, in homes, in multifamily dwellings uh, in New York City. So um, I recently got an R21 uh, to look at this, but before that I had gotten um, a pilot grant from the Center for uh, Environmental Health in Northern Manhattan to look at um, 30 buildings in Northern Manhattan that are uh, burning number six fuel, and we're looking at them this year and we'll follow up next year uh, to see whether or not there are any um, major differences um, in the air quality, both indoor and outdoor air quality, and also we're looking at temperature and humidity. Many of you who may live in multifamily buildings in New York City know that there's a phenomenon of overheating, uh, and that has kind of particular implications for um, our for our community, uh, and my community partner on this is We Act. So um, I can't provide data on those studies right now, but certainly be on the lookout um, because we will uh, be publishing voraciously. Um, so I'd like to kind of um, draw my, uh, my, my talk to, to a close, thinking about policy and what can be done. I'm a sociologist by training, and as a sociologist, uh, we're really good at noting problems. Um, but I am happy for the transition to public health because um, it really allows uh, for the, uh, at least, um, the, uh, the offer of solutions uh, and policy solutions in particular. So um, Merle, that same woman that was talking about senseless heat, and she was also talking about um, the, she critiqued um, Section 8 um, ha uh, housing or subsidized housing. Um, she says, a lot of money should go into these agencies for people like myself who have a high gas bill or people who, you know, have high electric bills. Um, and so, um, you know, in keeping with her recommendation, one of the things to do may be to expand light heat benefits uh, while uh, we understand that it's um, critical uh, that people have more access to these kinds of services that provide cushions and provide safety nets against the consequences of poverty. Um, LIHEAP and weatherization assistance program um, outside of uh, some kind of spurts of, of uh, funding that came through the stimulus package have gone uh, down year after year. Um, the funding has been cut. Um, but we should also implement energy efficiency standards uh, in subsidized housing and other kind of multifamily dwellings. Um, and then also um, create comprehensive energy, housing, and health policies since they're all interrelated. Um, so this is kind of getting a, a, a little bit into um, to LIHEAP. Um, I've written papers about this and I can um, direct you to them. But what I really want to direct you to um, is that uh, our community often is equipped with their own um, solutions to problems. And I just want to highlight this particular um, a policy um, brief uh, that was written by Mothers on the Move uh, and some uh, researchers at CUNY uh, called South Bronx Resident Solution on Greening Our Hood, which is about retrofitting, creating deep retrofits um, in the energy infrastructure and public housing um, to um, deal with the kind of um, housing quality issues, to deal with um, health issues, uh, and to deal with workforce development issues by employing and training training uh, public housing residents um, to be able to do this. Uh, and, and with that, I, I will conclude uh, with acknowledgments uh, for a fabulous team that has um, been really instrumental in helping me collect data uh, and my collaborators uh, and other special contributors, of course, funding sources. Um, and I also want to acknowledge um, Bob Full of Love because he's been an amazing mentor and super supportive of all of the outlandish ideas that I pop into his office with, including public health entrepreneurship, uh, which we've um, co-written a paper 
on. Uh, these are a few references for papers that I've written on uh, energy insecurity. Um, and with that, I'd like to say thank you. Oh, public health entrepreneurship? Um, it's basically um, social entrepreneurship, uh, but with kind of a public health um, angle. So um, anything, I mean, I'm mostly interested in um, uh, entrepreneurial ventures that are really getting at the upstream determinants of health. I am a social entrepreneur. I invest in real estate. Um, and have rehabbed several brownstones uh, in the South Bronx uh, for multiple reasons. First, because I'm a South Bronx native, uh, and I moved back to the South Bronx for political purposes. Um, and that is, you know, I mean, in many ways, that was the kind of impetus for um, thinking about how other people might be able to combat these like um, very complicated and complex social problems by um, engaging in market solutions rather than um, just uh, expecting, you know, like uh, depending on grants and other things. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Am I?